Please welcome Keto Miner, Stacey Wailiko, Christian Rotzall, Sebastian Kung, and Anita Posh for the Lightning Hardware and Nodes panel. Hello, thanks. Yeah, hello and uh, good morning on this second day. Um, yeah, we're starting off with a little uh, introduction. So please introduce yourself very shortly and tell us which device you are presenting and uh, which core functionalities does it have? Is it a Bitcoin full node? Has it integrated Lightning too? Can it also be used as a hardware wallet in that? Uh, so I'm, I'm Keta Miner, also called Michael, and uh, I'm representing the Nodo full node. Uh, we also do the Nodo Cloud, the Nodo Rack, and hosting services. Uh, it's a it's a hardware full node with Lightning, and the goal of the project is to have the most open platform possible, so you can run it with any third party uh, software or hardware wallet. Hi everyone, my name is Stacy, and I'm a developer at Casa, and I'm here to be talking about our plug and play Bitcoin Lightning full node, and we've designed it such that. Hopefully, your mom can just use it with like no issues. We've tried to make everything as simple as possible. And we also have a companion mobile app called Sats App where you can connect to your node from anywhere over Tor. Hi, I'm Sebastian. I work with Saticus on the Bitbox space. Um, the Bitbox space is basically also a Bitcoin full node, obviously. It runs a Electrum server. I run C Lightning. And I've written, together with Timo Block, an application that allows to connect it to the Bitbox Wallet app. Um, besides that, I'm also a Monero developer, and I work on reproducible build. Hi, my name is Christian, also known as Ruzo. Um, I'm working on the Recipe Blitz. Um, the Recipe Blitz is a Bitcoin and Lightning full node. That's more the approach of build it yourself. So it's a GitHub project where you go and you find a complete list of Amazon links where you can order the same single parts. Works with a Raspberry Pi, so you get some some hard drive, uh, SSD, something, and uh, and put it all together, um, and then install the software, the open source software, and and kind of do it yourself. It's very community driven, and a little bit the specialty is that it has a display on top that's touchable, and it now more and more develops into a little bit thing like touchy thingy that you can then more and more control than even um, with the touch screen. Mm -hmm, thanks. Can we go deeper into the core design principles, please? Like, um, is it, I mean, you said it uh, a little bit now, but um, what are the target customers for your products also? Because I think the design principles are also dependent on the customer. So we are not like, um, we are not, making something which your mom can use yet. Uh, we are getting there. Uh, the goal is really to be the most complete solution and allow you to move like, uh, okay, let me rephrase that. Uh, the node enables you to not use any third party external service anymore for your Bitcoin Lite. So we want to integrate all possible hardware wallets, software wallets, block explorers, uh, mempool.space, and all the services you may need for your Bitcoin Lite, including mixers, uh, we already have Weopo, we don't exclude including Wasabi in the future, uh, BTC Pay Server, and really have an all-in-one solution. And the online version, the Nodo Cloud, is exactly the same, but um, as a rental service on the internet. Yeah, and as you mentioned, I would say that we're probably the opposite of that. We, we want to build something that's really easy, because the reality is a lot of people who are here in Bitcoin didn't come here through the technical path. They came here through finance, economics, even something like game theory. So we're just, our, our target user is really somebody who likes Bitcoin, wants to use it, but isn't, isn't ready for some more technical jargon and details that come with it. I guess in the end, we kind of all want to do basically the same, right? We want to give people a piece of their own personal sovereignty back again. Um, at Bitbox, I guess, we mostly focus on integration with our existing products, We're trying to really achieve a closed ecosystem, or, well, not obviously proprietary closed ecosystem, but a closed ecosystem in the sense of that a user can run it just by himself without relying on a third party. 
uh, for the recipe blitz, it's um, not really about customers, it's about community. So, uh, and uh, it's a build-it-yourself approach. So, um, it's, for, it's a little bit for people that are a little bit on the tinkering side, maybe the geeks a little bit. But um, it should be more and more get easier even for people that are just maybe just technically interested. And maybe at one point it, it can develop into a build-it-yourself friends and family node. Um, that said, we at least if you, if you at least don't want to get all the hardware stuff, uh, and build it, uh, put it together yourself. You can order a complete um, to build together recipe blitz either from the shop, the shop.fulmo.org, where you can get the complete set or, it, uh, or already pre-assembled, and everybody else is free to to to, to uh, offer a pre-built recipe blitz. So if you want, so it's not really about customers; it's a little bit more about a community-driven approach. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about buying a Bitcoin node or a Lightning node, uh, I'm mostly interested in, in trusting uh, or verifying my own trans Bitcoin, Bitcoin transactions because I don't want the hassle to install a full node on my laptop and stuff. Uh, do your products uh, verify Bitcoin transactions? I mean, can I verify I, my own? I, I think I can speak for everyone here. Yeah, that's the main goal of uh, having a hardware phone. Okay, I just heard that not all devices do that, so that I'm, that's why I'm asking. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is a misinformation, yeah. Yeah. So um, those boxes, I think everybody has uh, started with, um, with very small hardware. So uh, I think the Casa box also in the beginning, Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, Raspberry Pi also had the Raspberry Pi 3 in the past, now also offering or being able to use the Raspberry Pi 4. And with the Raspberry Pi 3, because it was such a low-powered hardware, um, you, you would need maybe to get the whole blockchain. You, cannot, you were not able to verify it yourself. Um, so you had to rely on some kind of downloaded blockchain, whatever. That was not a good approach. But now with the Raspberry Pi 4, and I think even other, also all the other boxes are using now powerful enough hardware to really verify the whole complete blockchain yourself and have the whole copy of the blockchain then at your, at your service. And then you can do everything with your node and, and verify everything on your side without relying on any third party. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are other reasons for people to run their own Lightning node at home? Um, well, I guess at some point routing will probably become interesting to people as like a uh, side income stream, but that's still quite way down the road. So currently it's, I mean, custodial lightning wallets are nice usable, I guess, but you obviously kind of trust them. So it's all about eliminating trust again, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'll also say that when a lot of us launched about a year ago, you couldn't, there weren't that many custodial lightning solutions, if any at all, out there on the market, um, especially mobile wallets. And so the only way to participate in the network was to actually run a node, <laughs> which I think is kind of fun. Um, and then there's obviously the financial freedom, self-sovereignty aspect where you know, you don't have to rely on anyone to ask if you can spend your money or not. You, no one's going to charge you exorbitant fees like we see with remittances and fiat. And you always have access to your funds. Um, uh, if you want to receive payments at any time, you have to run a node because your mobile phone with a map can't receive funds if the app is off, obviously. Um, so either you run a custodial solution or you run your own full node. And also... Uh, with Keysend, which will hopefully be merged soon, it was supposed to be in 080, but it's not. <laughs> uh, you will be able to push payments to people. You don't, no more has to have this invoice uh, request uh, procedure, so you can just send money to someone uh, as long as the node is online. And this also enables other applications. You've probably seen on the conference uh, Telegram channel uh, we work with our friends from Sphinx Chat on a chat, app chat application which is based on the Lightning Protocol, which is using Keysend to, to make a chat and payment application, similar to WeChat, uh, but over Lightning. Yeah, and I think, um, at least for, from the recipe blitz um, idea, it's really the idea of having this friends and family node. So um, maybe not everybody in your, in your uh, 
closer uh, family or, or, or friendships, they will run a full node. But because they have just uh, have it on their mobile phone, maybe a wallet, a non-custodial wallet, we see more and more of those solutions. But the question is, do you want to care about all this channel management or whatever? So maybe you, you build a channel to one person you trust in your family or wider area that is running a constant full on node at home. And, um, and there from there on, you have good connectivity into the rest of the network. Um, if you don't have something like that, people rely very quickly on these uh, centralized services. So running your own node is, is a very important approach, uh, approach to keep everything decentralized and at, at the privacy level that is needed um, or that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And how open are your devices? I mean, in terms of software and wallets, uh, do you provide your own custom build or do you recommend to use uh, specific wallets or software? So we obviously have our own custom-made software for the communication with our um, desktop and mobile app. But besides that, um, we obviously only run open source and like commonly used Bitcoin software. Um, I've spent a lot of time evaluating the different components we ended up putting into the Bitbox space. Um, so as Sadek has previously touched on in his presentation, um, we mainly chose Sea Lightning because of its um, ability to extend the actual Lightning CLI and Lightning Server capabilities with the Python plugin system. Um, then besides that, we also run the Electrum Rust server, which so far has proven um, at least in when, when running it on low powered hardware to just be a better fit than the full um, Electrum X server. Yeah, we have our own custom web UI and uh, SaaS app, which is the, the mobile wallet that you can access the Lightning wallet capabilities on your node. So as I said before, we are trying like to to work closely with uh, third party wallets and software. So we we interact a lot with people like BTC Pay servers, App, Zeus, uh, fully noded, uh, and others. And we are really trying to make the experience of pairing these wallets with our node as seamless as possible. With the recent enablement enablement of Tor for all the services on the box, we now can and the recent advancement in the library Tor library for iOS, uh, we now have. Uh, support for direct pairing to Tor for full in audit and Zap is coming in a few days probably. Uh, yeah, the Rest Biblitz as a community project tries to keep open as much as possible, like providing the standard interfaces. So any wallet outside that is able to connect, for example, to an LND that is running on the Rest Biblitz can connect to it. So, and on the Rest Blitz itself, um, you're very free to, um, to experiment and, and to contribute uh, additional software you want to run. So you can do it personally, hack on your device, and if you see it's working for you, you can make it work for other people, like providing con configure scripts, so to install stuff very easy and to integrate with the node. And if this is working then good, it can more and more develop into a standard feature that you can switch on. So it's a quite very open approach. Mm -hmm. Open source is important. Begin, begin from here. Go away. Uh, no problem. Um, so uh, when I have a node at home and I'm out about and out and about with my smartphone, can I connect to the uh, devices and verify my stuff? So if if you're in a home network, you can actually connect to the Bitbox space um, more or less automatically with our app supports um, MDNS detection in your local network. When you're out of out and about, um, we obviously will display to a home connected node the local IP address um, of that node and also eventually the external IP address of that node. But I mean, obviously Tor is the nice solution for this because well, it gives you your own IP without any additional cost. Um, it provides you full end-to-end -end encryption. So currently I can connect, for example, my um, 
my mobile Electrum client to a Onion address that is given to the Bitbox base and then stream transactions over it. Uh, yep, for the Casa node, if you have chosen to enable Tor, you can absolutely connect to your node on the go and with SATS app, that's, that's how the connection is made. So we, we used to support only VPN connections, uh, mostly through zero tier, which, uh, which builds like a mesh to VPN between all your devices. Uh, and now the preferred model is also Tor. Yeah, when you're, when you're mobile, it's always hard. Uh, if you have your node running at home and you're mobile, it, it really, it's, it's a challenge for a lot of people to make this node available, to reachable from the outside, because most people run their nodes behind a, a router and a internet router provides you with a NAT, so everything that's running in your local network is not that easily reachable. People with techno technology enabled or geeky people know how to forward ports and maybe know how to do dynamic DNS, but this is for most people, the normal people, or technically interested people, even sometimes uh, hard to configure. So we see, see more and more things, services that are now developing. I also heard that on the Bitbox base, there's uh, the idea of providing a service to, to make a Tor IP bridge, because we heard Tor is a good solution, but Tor is not easy to run on every mobile phone. iOS, for example, doesn't like. So the iPhone does, Apple doesn't like running Tor on, on, uh, on, on the iPhone. So it's really hard to use that solution. So we maybe need some kind of services that bridge the Tor world that gives you the privacy to the IP world that is easy, reachable and usable on every mobile device. Mm -hmm. Speaking of functionalities, uh, is the Watchtower functionality in your setup included or is it not necessary? Uh, just quick for the Raspberry Blitz, the Watchtowers came, the Raspberry Blitz is using LND, and LND has now the, uh, the first version of Watchtowers in there now, and from the LND version itself, the, the, the latest one would support that, that is running on the Raspberry Blitz, but we don't have it kind of integrated into the user, user, user interface, so people, they have LND running, they can configure it if they really want to, but the Raspberry Blitz has an, at the moment not an easy interface to, um, to, to set it up, so you need to really get, get nerdy to, to get it going. Um, we haven't decided on that yet. We've basically, um, or we're currently basically just trying to settle on how we're going to build our Lightning API. So additional features like watch showers are still some way down the road. So probably within the next six months, we'll have some form of watchtower um, support that we can announce. Uh, watchtowers are definitely something that we have talked about and considered. However, I think we're in the same boat as Raz the Blitz. We're running LND, but I mean, you could go hop into the command line and turn them on. We, we highly discourage that, though, for our users. So not at the moment, um, no. No, it's the same. We, we are looking into watchtowers, but we don't like to integrate things that we don't fully understand, and it's quite fuzzy still. OK. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about security. How would a user verify that the node software is correct and the node itself is healthy? And uh, do you have any procedures or incentives for the hardware users that they run upgrades of the software or for firmware regularly? Um, so about the verification of what runs on the node, we follow like the best practices of every project. So if you go to a Bitcoin core page, you have a set of commands you have to run, like check the checksums, PGP signatures, same, same for LND and for other software. It's all automated. Uh, so if you want to trust our code, which is just simple shell scripts, uh, you will get the feedback in the web UI. Uh, if something fails, some check fails. Uh, if you want to verify it yourself, you're free to SSH into the device and just run these comments yourself and check that what we show you in the UI is true. Um, about the updates, uh, we don't push updates to the users because we don't want to uh, the devices to ping home. Uh, we don't want to know where our users are, and we, I mean, yeah, it's basic privacy. So uh, we use um, DNSSEC to sign uh, TXT records, which are used like for signaling uh, of the updates. And when the device gets a new version, it just a button changes color to green to show that there is an update. The user can click on it. We are planning like to 
use the same mechanism to push like critical information to the users as well. So in the UI, when you log into the, to the device, you will get big red notification if there is some critical update. Um, the only time it happened, um, the critical update happened was the CV on Lightning, but we were patched like a month before. So. As far as updates go, you can log into your dashboard and see what versions of LND and Bitcoin you're running, but we really try to be as noisy as possible. We give you pop-up notifications in the UI and we release blog posts and for especially um, critical vulnerabilities like the most recent one in September with Lightning, uh, we will reach out to our customers directly. And in, in terms of checking the health of your node, we just launched a really cool feature called Heartbeats with SATS app where you can request our servers to ping your node and we incentivize this by, um, if you get five successful heartbeats in a week, we will give you 10,000 sats. Um, so we do full disk image updates, meaning we do not update individual components. So if there is a critical vulnerability in any of the binaries that we ship inside that disk image, we will have to update the entire disk image. Um, that said, we can obviously not just um, shut down the node every single time we um, push out an update, because obviously that will be an absolute user usability nightmare. Um, but we haven't quite decided yet on how to notify the user on updates yet. Um, however, I would obviously also like to use um, DNSSEC for update notification. Um, Monero actually does that as well. Um, at this point, I also obviously like to take the opportunity to plug reproducible builds. Um, I give my Gitian signatures to the Bitcoin core releases. So um, we, we obviously then check with the normal um, procedure that's outlined in the Bitcoin Bitcoin Core README on how to correctly verify and download the Bitcoin Core builds. Then for the other components of, of our software, um, I'm kind of getting involved in their release process and trying to push them towards um, strict release processes and eventually reproducible builds, but yeah, it's an uphill battle always. It will take some time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the update is always a critical question because you don't wanna, want to run a, a node at your home uh, that is all under your, under your control, but then automatically gets updates from a central kind of position. So because then the central position could take over all the nodes that are out there. Um, so I think everybody tries to find a good solution for that. Uh, and our idea is really that you um, that you really have to do it manual yourself. You have to be a little bit aware, maybe on Twitter, to know, oh, there is a new version coming out. And then you kind of re take out the SD card from the recipe blitz. You put the new kind of uh, image on the SD card and then put it back in there. You can get an uh, image from our, from the website, from our website, that is kind of signed by kind of uh, me personally. But uh, if you don't trust me um, for, for convenience, you can go and check out the shell script uh, and see really what it's installed because it's based on a plain Raspbian um, in, um, Linux. So, and then you can see really in the shell script what kind of services are added and how they're signed. So if you want to take the time, you can take that. Um, so, and so this is the way how we try to avoid being having a central update service. So to, to just to don't get people into that convenience to expect that we will care about their hardware and software. So with Lightning, we have no seed. Uh, what happens if my hardware device is destroyed or it's stolen, for instance? How do you back up the uh, channel states? Yeah, so we're very lucky that uh, LND uh, that is running on Raspberry Blitz now has the static channel backups. So this, so you have your seed and there, then you have this static channel backup file that is always, or, uh, every time you open a channel or close a channel, this file is, uh, is, is updated. Normally you have it in your LND folder. The recipe blitz automatically makes a copy from your hard drive. If this file changes, or automatically makes a copy of this file to your SD card. So if something fails, you have at least will find a copy somewhere. 
if the device gets stolen, so you should take care about remote uh, backup so that this, the, because you need the seed and this file, and if your device is stolen, this file is gone. So you need to make sure that this file, every time when it's changed, that it's be stored somewhere else, not on your device. The Raspberry Blitz gives you two options for that. Either you configure an own server you have, and then it's an SCP. Uh, um, it will copy it automatically to that server. That's a little bit technical, but you can even use Dropbox for that. Yes, Dropbox is a centralized service, but this, C to, uh, this uh, static channel backup file is encrypted, so you might want to take you could, may, could take this risk and, and just use this reliable stor uh, or remote storage uh, possibility. So it's your choice if you want to get nerdy, control everything under yourself, or you use Dropbox just as a central storage service, but it should be encrypted good enough so that you don't get it into a risk. Um, so we ship, or we will, we will be shipping the Bitbox base with a USB stick plugged in. Um, when you start the base the first time, the lightning um, seed, well, it is a seed, not seed words, will be written to that um, USB drive, and you can then take it out and if, if you need to restore it from any machine that you want to. Um, C Lightning just very recently started adding channel state backups, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm still a bit suspicious of them. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, n n Nifty Nay and a part of, or uh, actually, basically, two other people who contributed to Python plugins for backing up. Um, you see, Lightning Channel states have made great work so far, but I will give it some weeks to mature now. We are also using the static channel backups from LND. We save this to the SD card, which will protect you against hard drive failures. However, if the device is stolen, um, the best you can do is probably restore your uh, your your layer one funds <laughs> to uh, using the seed phrase. So currently we're on LND and uh, what we are doing is you plug in a USB drive to the back of the device and you have to put your PGP public key uh, in, the, in the UI. So all the backups are encrypted. Uh, the, I mean, the seed is encrypted on the USB drive and the static channel backup doesn't need to because it's encrypted with the seed itself. Uh, what we will be doing in the future, because that works for every Lightning implementation, is just a mirroring of the whole Lightning data directory uh, to the same USB drive in addition to this static backup. So you will have normally the capability to restore your lightning state with the current state of the channels and the transactions in case it fails. Uh, and also a little plug for our friends from Async who have the best <laughs> backup procedure for lightning. The seed alone is enough to restore all the channels for the states. So a lightning node should be online 24-7. How does your device handle the fact that it is offline sometimes? It doesn't really have to be online 24-7. Only if you want to receive transactions uh, at an unknown moment, uh, which currently is not possible anyway because you have to issue an invoice unless you're running some other software like BTC Pay. Um, the resynchronization of a lightning uh, when the network is cut and restored is pretty fast, actually. So that's not really an issue. The only problem is during the, of course, when your device is offline, you can't receive payment. For us, it's really important that the node is online all the time because when it's offline, it's getting further and further behind and blocks. And because the Raspberry Pi is such a low power device, it's very costly to do that validation. So this is another reason why we introduced the heartbeats is to just incentivize people to check on their node every day, make sure everything's looking good. And it's, it's helped us with um, support as well because the faster people can catch issues, um, the, the, the better, like we can get them up and running faster. Yeah. Um, so it's something my heart, like heartbeats would really, really be nice. Um, often catch um, my sister, for example, I'm plugging my nodes. <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, besides that, um, we also take care that we 
So in, in case there's a network failure or the, the node shuts down, that on restart that we start these services um, in an order that they don't um, keep on hanging on each other or that Z Lightning already starts syncing um, when Bitcoin is still doing um, IBD or catching up on the current chain tip. Yeah, to, to have your channels kind of safe, you don't need to be all the time online, so the devices can kind of handle some out times. The question is how these offline times are happening. So the worst case, if you have a power outage and chips, just the power goes out, this is not very friendly to the hardware and can result into data corruption. So, and then with your data corruption, then your channel state might be in mess, and so, so this is gets dirty. Um, so for the recipe blitz, at least we uh, we gave a little bit support for uh, um, a UPS, so a kind of a extra device that takes care of the power goes out. It gives you some battery extra time so that the device can shut down cleanly. So that's okay. So at least in, in this that direction. Um, so you, it can be offline a bit. So if you're longer, if you know that you're longer times offline, you have to manage your channels more closely and and up the time that it's uh, kind of. Uh, um, can be online, uh, can be offline the channel. Okay, thanks. So closing up, do you have? Some? Yeah, just a quick addition. Uh, I think the yeah the advice we can give to any user of any hardware node is buy yourself a new PS. It costs like fifty to one hundred euros. Uh, one with USB support, preferably, so it can notify the device when it's almost empty and shut it down cleanly. Okay, thanks. So now closing question: What are your future plans for your products? Okay, so as you probably know, we have the Samurai device coming out. It's already on pre-sale and it will be shipping in December. Um, it's uh, next level for us because it has uh, mirrored storage, so it addresses a lot of issues of data corruption. It has full disk encryption, so if someone steals your device uh, or has physical access to your device, they can't do anything with it. It has a kill switch. If you try to open the box, uh, it turns off and the hard disk encryption key goes away from the memory. The memory is in such a place in the device that it resists to freezing attacks. <laughs> and it will be coming with a, a add-on module to have an internal UPS in a few months after it comes out. Cool. Uh, we just announced Casa Node 2, and that's going to get a nice hardware upgrade with the Raspberry Pi 4 and an SSD drive. And uh, this, we're, we're integrating BTC Pay Server, so hopefully we'll be able to help out some of those uh, mom and pop merchants. Yeah, so in the next few months, we'll be um, probably mostly working on getting our lighting integration done. Um, besides that, we, I guess our end goal kind of is to create a device that can act as an HSM for C Lightning. So just create a device that is as secure as possible, or allows you to run Lightning in an as secure fashion as possible. Uh, yeah, the, the recipe blitz is kind of, uh, in the beginning it was just to get it working, it was interest to, uh, to, to get everything together. Um, now we are still in a little bit closing up the phase to stabilize, to make everything more stable. So the preventing this data corruption things and caring about this stuff, maybe also taking about care about mirroring data. And then we now with the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, is out, the device is a little bit more powerful. So now we can more and more see what other applications make sense to to add to the device, so for, for example, Electrum server would make sense, or um, uh, BC Pay server, so it, that you can more and more do with your node. And and of course, what we have, uh, we the, the touch screen now and the casing is getting more and more polished and more features, so that we more and more use now the touch features and make it more easily to daily manage your node just and and, and interact with it. So. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're all looking forward to see what's coming in the next month. And thanks for listening.